Good morning. Welcome to Journeys in Podcasting, uh, broadcasting from New York. I'm close to NYU, uh, currently at the ITP camp, and we're here with Jiki today of Chibitronics, and she's going to walk us through what Chibitronics is, first of all. Uh, hi. Yeah, thanks so much for having me here. Uh, so Chibitronics is actually um, a hardware startup that grew out of my PhD research. So um, I'm G, and I... Um, uh, worked in the high-low tech and responsive environments uh, research groups at the Media Lab. And while I was there, I researched ways to use um, arts and crafts, uh, uh, paper arts and crafts, and blend it with programming and building electronics. So uh, part of that was um, creating it myself, but the other part was figuring out how to share this with the wider community. And so I started making my own tools, like um, stickers that are actually circuits, um, and things like that. And Chibitronics is kind of the company that grew out of that, that research. Um, and that was kind of started in collaboration with my co-founder, Bunny Huang. Um, and now, uh, Chibitronics is going strong, and we're now working on some things to um, basically add more into our activity to our projects using programming and sensors, things like that. Um, and I'm also currently a postdoc now in the lifelong kindergarten group there. I wasn't sure if you're going to go into that. So, um, how, how does that work at, at MIT? Because I, I noticed out of that same cooperative or organization, um, Little Bits comes out of that, which is very popular in the elementary, middle school years. Um, how, how did you all form this, and is there some kind of uniting philosophy or, or in the cooperative? Uh, well, the Media Lab is a research department at MIT, so it's a, basically a graduate school. It's a master's and PhD program, so it's more of a, a graduate school with a, you know, that is a research lab and a cooperative. Um, and within those, there were different research groups involved. So for example, I was in Hilo Tech, which is led by Leah Beakley, um, and our focus was on traditional crafts, low tech, blending that with electronics, programming technologies, et cetera, high tech. So that was why it was called Hilo Tech. Um, Aya, who started Little Bits, she was in a group called Computing Culture that um, kind of looked at creating art using technology. That's my understanding of it anyway. Um, and other cool projects like Mickey Makey and Scratch are kind of coming from the education and learning and play focused group called Lifelong Kindergarten, which is where I am now. And so these are actually three different research groups and the projects kind of came out of research uh, or people who, who, who work there. But for example, Little Bits was started after Aya uh, was no longer at the lab. Um, and uh, while it, my project was started as a research project, um, cool stuff like Makey Makey and Scratch were all started as research projects that um, are still research projects at the lab or have since spun out. So it's kind of um, a really cool um, place where, you know, you, as, as a creator, you come and you get inspired and you make stuff and then you might spin it out into the rest of the world. Uh, excuse me, one moment. Um, Hi. You don't yeah. Thanks. Right, Oops. Sorry about that. I am traveling right now. <laughs> no, I, I'm, uh, a, I'm, a, I'm actually living I'm actually out of living out of. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, um, I, 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 I'm getting a lot of echo over here. Let's wait just a second. Okay, I think it went away. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard you say in, in talks. I, I looked at your talks. Oh, yeah. 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 Ye
Um, what attracted you to paper and light? And are, are you speculating a near future where paper, light, and conductivity will kind of merge? Um, well, so paper kind of came very early. I, I've basically been obsessed with paper since I was very little. Um, I, so the story goes that my uh, mom, she was, she worked at a hospital and one of her patients as a thank you gift made her these little origami, a balloon and a little dog. And I was probably two or something at the time. And she brought the origami home and I just fell in love with these magical things that came out of ordinary pieces of paper. And so I got obsessed with origami. And then she got me a, a, a little book that shows you how to do it. And I basically started folding paper and just obsessing it over since then. Um, and it's because it's a material that's everywhere. It's you, you, no matter where you are, you might not have a lot of uh, fancy toys or whatever, but you can make stuff out of the paper because it's, it's basically, you know, you can get fresh paper or you could recycle it from like a packaging or something. And, and so it's, it's, it's friendly. You don't, it's not precious. You, you're okay kind of really playing with it. The other thing is paper, um, you can draw on it and it's, it's a material that accepts uh, very easily modifications. So it's a very creative material. And finally, a paper comes in many different forms, right? So it can be stiff and hold form like cardboard. It can be soft like fabric and tissues or just like regular paper. You could fold it. So there's just a lot of properties, even though it's all paper and you can attach it to each other. Um, so I can go on forever about how cool paper is. So, so that's kind of the one side. Uh, light um, and conductive that allows light to work, that came later actually um, when I started working with Leah. She was like, hey, I want you to make sensors and stuff um, out of these conductive materials and paper because she knew I was into, into paper. Um, and what that did was it took this regular uh, paper craft, which I already thought was cool, which I already loved, and then added this whole other dimension to it, this like interactivity because you know lights can change, lights are dynamic. Um, and the conductive materials are, you know, what powers them to do that. Um, and so that made a cool thing even cooler in my mind. Um, and on the flip side, you know, the circuitry itself, like a glowing light is really cool, but once you can add petals to it, or once you add like a scene to it, that gives the light more meaning and which also similarly makes a cool thing even cooler. So that's a good blend, but why light? So it's actually, um, just as a friendly thing to start with because it's low power leds are low power you get instant feedback and you can modulate it so that it's either bright or medium brightness so on. so you have a lot of um control and it's a good place to start like electronically it's not complicated to get it to work and so with that um it's a it's a great kind of beginning thing and that's why i've kind of explored it the most similarly because it's so visual i guess um it 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 matches a lot of the creative metaphors that we might have already like drawing and painting all of that it's a way to make a mark on a paper light is a way to make a dynamic mark on a paper uh, is one way to look at it um and so so that's kind of where that comes from but um well and all these other ways something about blinky lights and warm glows i think naturally attract me and maybe other people so there's that too um but actually elect uh, electricity powers all sorts of things like motors like shape memory alloy like like speakers and so um, for me light is more of the beginning <laughs> and then there's like so many other um, actuation ways of um, making something dynamic that I hope to explore more the I think part of the reason why I've done so much with light now is because I am um, also working on kind of sharing this, making this uh, way of making accessible to other people. And since it's turning, uh, since it's it's more of like a, a, a teaching and learning experience, I want to start with something that's uh, simple to grasp and kind of gives you quick successes, but still gives you a lot of open space to express yourself. And so that's why that, but personally, I'm hoping to really branch out into different mediums as well. Um, and then the different conductive materials you mentioned like conductive tapes or paints or whatever, um, you know, you kind of need those to build your circuit. Basically, uh, you have to add power to those lights or motors or whatever somehow. Um, but using unusual materials, like rather than wire, we use 
tape or paint, that um, is because these other materials, tape or paint, um, also have a lot of expressive affordances that wire may not have. Um, also, there's a lot of familiar familiarity. So as you're encountering these new ideas of resistance and whatnot, at least you know how to use a piece of tape. Um, and you can use that, that, that knowledge that you already have to kind of scaffold your new learning and creating experience. Um, and I guess the last thing is we do think of tape and paint as a, a material, as a creative thing, whereas I think we typically think of like wires as a thing that's already done, um, a little more so anyway, so that um, folks might be less um, quick to start uh, thinking of it not as a pre-made thing, but as a thing that like needs manipulation to turn into something else. I don't know if that kind of yeah, I mean, I've been in Arduino land for the last month. Oh, where okay. like breadboards are all over the place, so it, it's it's really interesting to parallel a, a lot of things happening. But a lot of the workshop as well have been centered around this um, idea of taking old old crafts and and making them bridging them with all of our modern expressive tools as well. Um, going back to this idea of the Z tape, the oh. anisotropic conductive adhesive tape. Um, and you add it to these flexible circuit boards, virtually any conductive material can be soldered, uh, sewn with conductive thread, or just sticking down into conductive foils, inks mm -hmm. and um, Looking at this conducting across mediums, I, I'm, I'm comparing it to kind of this um, Theo Jensen strand beast that's powered mm -hmm. by wind that, that blows, across the, um, mm -hmm. blows across the beaches. And it's kind of permeated this month at ITP is this idea of extending human sensory into machine sensories. Um, it takes this idea of phenomenology to like a whole new level. You've created art installation. I've looked at your um, dandelion paintings where mm -hmm. the circuitry viewed from the back is in some ways as beautiful as the design and the illumination from the front. Not to mention all the coding um, that can be approached from as, a, as the perspective of a designer or as a systems thinker. How do you move through this creative process? Like, do you think of it more from a design perspective, from a coding perspective, from a craft perspective? Uh, it's a, it's a good question. It actually reminds me of a, of a conference session that I just went to yesterday where it's like, uh, someone talked about, there's all these maps, the design maps where it's like some, some of them look like kind of like a cycle. Like you come up with an idea, you try it, you iterate, um, and then you kind of go again. And then there's like other maps that, you know, there's like, maybe you you go back and forth a little bit and then his map was like there's some spots and then there's like a tangled mess in between i would say that last one is closest to mine where it's like it really is unpredictable um you know there's the idea that i'm excited about and that's like the energy that keeps me going then there's the you know like fighting with the material sometime to get it to what you to do what you want to do sometimes it like refuses because physics has its own rules and then I have to like go back and think about the idea and maybe change that so it's very non-linear but um for something like the dandelion uh first of all the idea was inspired by a workshop so um where where there was a a graduate student named jesse uh and and zach who created um that she was a a biology PhD so like everything she did was plants related and I was doing a workshop on sensors so we actually did we were doing microphones and one of the sensing properties I said you can blow on this microphone to make stuff happen and then she created a single dandelion poster and it was, we, the whole room was like oh my god and because it was so magical and so the idea came from that like how do we make a whole bunch of these that talk together right um, and then I personally, I, I was born in China, I grew up in the US, I'm interested in kind of exploring my own culture. So I got into uh, ink painting. And so that was kind of the painting side of that project. And I, I liked how in traditional Chinese ink painting, um, uh, the 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 arrangement the uh, composition there you go often has a lot of blank spaces which I thought lended itself nicely to animation because in those spaces where you can make things that change um, and so I was exploring that kind of idea and then um, I I wanted to play with the idea of like networking multiple microcontrollers and so that's that's what enabled me to like make 
use one microcontroller per flower so that the flowers talk to each other and tell each other when the seed is coming their way and it's their turn to, to, to turn on basically and start a flower. So instead of having, you know, one microcontroller, I had like 15 or 20 on that painting talking to each other. And that was a fun thing to learn. So it was just a whole bunch of elements kind of coming together. Um, uh, but not at the same time, mind you, it was more like, try one thing, get it to work, okay, try the next thing, get it to work, okay, then try to see if I can get them to talk to each other, okay, that works, but now let's like add another one. Um, it was a very um, incremental process. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know it, it sounds like many elements of maker culture in there where, you, where you're tinkering, iterating, testing. Yeah, because it never works the first time. And sometimes it doesn't even work the 20th time, even though I've done it 19 times before. So, you know, it's a lot of patience, I think. Yeah. Um, I hear you gravitating uh, repeatedly back to this idea of um, evoking wonder in, ah. in, in students. And kind of as a teacher perspective, I wonder if you could comment just on um, the importance of that feeling for our own development, for our own learning. Um, I, I constantly, you know, working with kids, am amazed by like if you can immerse them and capture their wonder around a topic, then they're much more likely to work that much harder to you know, learn about that thing. Um, what has been your experience there? Um, I mean, I guess I can uh, share a little bit of how how I experience wonder. It's it's a very it's a very energizing and motivated feeling, but to put it a little academically, there was um, uh, the, the idea of wonder is defined um, as that feeling where you encounter something new and it is so new that you don't have any memories that like help you categorize it into something that you understand. So you're just kind of stuck there trying to figure out what's happening. And so, so and, and because you don't know what it is, suddenly you're trying to take in all this information. So your senses actually heighten, you know, your eyes open a little wider, you, 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 your time kind of, you, you, you block out all the other stuff and you naturally focus on this thing. And it's this amazing um, uh, kind of like moment. And, and as you're in that moment, that's when um, you, are, you, you are surprised that the world is not just what you thought it was. There's something a little bit more than what you thought was going on. And that kind of ignites this curiosity that kind of creates this sense of like, oh, the world is bigger than I thought, the, or the world just grew. Um, and there's that kind of expansive feeling. And what it uh, causes, at least for me, and maybe some other folks that I see, is that this sense of possibility, and there's this sense of curiosity. And those two things put together means you want to investigate, you have the energy um, to, to kind of go forth and explore. And you also know that there's a bigger world out there that's like drawing you in. So um, that uh, kind of like magical moment of curious energy or let's see is is really powerful for then you to actually do stuff to go and explore and, and to and to keep you um you as you as you as you wander um yeah wander through your wonder um the 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 other thing that uh was very interesting about this um idea of wonder is that uh if if every time we experience something new or surprising, it turns out to be harmful, like maybe it actually hurts us or we don't get it and we feel bad about ourselves, then we start to not be excited about new and wondrous things. And so from kind of a, like a learning and teaching perspective, we wanna um, create these moments of wonder, but make sure that a, a learner is not kind of like stuck hanging there and like does not have a way to pursue that curiosity and actually discover stuff. Because if that that second part doesn't happen, then we actually tend to shy away from the new. Um, and so that's when things like, um, a lot of folks, when they, if they're encountering electronics in the form of like, you know, an opened, computer so all you see is like the the printed circuit boards and all these components and nothing makes any sense it's kind of scary and maybe even dangerous if you touch the wrong thing you get shocked so like you know that's like this experience if there's a new thing but maybe you had an, a negative experience then you might not be curious about computers anymore but if you're encountering um electronics through like 
an interactive like light up costume that's like oh I know what a costume is and oh this thing is awesome and look I I know how to use thread like um, it's new but I have all these familiar things that tell me this is not bad this is not dangerous this is something I can understand then that new wonderful thing is actually cool you're not scared of it um, so I think I don't know that went a little sideways on, on the wonder topic there but I, I think that's like kind of an important part of it so learning how to create new experiences that are um, that 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 have little seeds of things that we know a little bit uh, so that we're not intimidated but then still creating spaces that feel genuinely new and surprising so that we are our interest is peaked basically um, yeah no I, I'm I'm I hear you all the way I mean yeah. I I think that most of learning in, in school should be like a wonder based motivation all the way up, you know, until middle school at least, where um, kids can kind of take control of yeah. in their own, own wonder. Um, I was really interested, well, let me try to explain this from a different perspective. At ITP, I've been into this like deconstruction of all things that, you know, oh. people are taking apart machines and reassembling them mm -hmm. as other beings. Um, so it's kind of this, this media literacy around artifact to be able to deconstruct it. But it, it goes into a much larger system of where do those, um, are, what are the materials for those artifacts come from? Where are they assembled, for example? Mm -hmm. So this happens to be the same month that Wired Magazine has this documentary featuring Bunny in it, um, right. where they're walking through things in, and wow. it's all about like the, the future cities of the world and how all of this, um, how the, all this economy works in Shenzhen, uh, of the deconstruction of parts, of the reconstruction, yeah. um, this guerrilla style manufacturing. Um, I, I wonder if you could comment sort of on how, how this came to be. Like, it, it sounds like you, you've said that you're, uh, the Bunny was giving a group of MIT students a tour in Shenzhen, mm -hmm. and then that's how you kind of created this partnership. Um, how is this such an important process of how things get made today? You know, we're talking about creating a sense of wonder with this beautiful circuitry, whereas the parts will be, you know, constructed in Shenzhen and the very creation of those parts is very dependent on this guerrilla style economy there. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't really a question. <laughs> yeah, that was a very complex web of let me, let me say it like this. Maybe you could explain sort of how it got started. Okay, it's a pretty yeah. interesting story. Okay, sure. So I'll start there and hopefully get into the rest of the. So so it started with so um, the cir the circuit stickers. That's kind of the project that started it. It started as a, a research project that me, my collaborator Natalie Freed and Adam Setupin, we did a class project where we actually handmade stickers using a vinyl cutter and soldering and stuff um, as a, a medium for kids to uh, build their own electronics. Uh, and then uh, fast forward a couple years later. Bunny was a visiting researcher at the Media Lab, and he proposed this idea of bringing students to Shenzhen to see kind of that ecosystem that he's so familiar with. And we were like, yeah, that sounds great. So me and um, six other students, I think, went over there, and we just, we visited all these different factories, and um, uh, we were trying to see how we might use those capabilities in our research projects. And so uh, this, the, the idea of creating the stickers came back because that's something that actually benefits from scale, right? Like rather than making raw materials by hand one by one, having a factory do it actually turns it in a tr into a true material. Um, and so, and then on the flip side, Bunny had never done flex PCBs before. So he was interested in that from like a material manufacturing perspective. And so it got really lucky that the two projects actually combined um, the same, um, the same project combined different curiosities. Like I wanted to make stickers, he wanted to make flex PCBs and see how that worked. And so we made flex PCB stickers. Um, and that grew from kind of like experiments that we did uh, to, to see if this was even manufacturable. Turns out it was when you add that uh, Z tape that you were talking about earlier, you can, it, it's a simple process that you could, you know, do it all in one and stamp it out. Um, and so it was physically possible, basically, that that was kind of like this cool moment where like, oh my gosh, it works. And, and we, what we did was like, the interesting thing is it's an ecosystem, like you described, there's, uh, you know, there's electronics, there's like fabric, there's leather, there's, um, books and printing like all and plastic molding there's like all these different factories that um are in a very close location and the cool thing is when you invent a new process like these stickers you know nobody had made stickers from circuit boards before because the two factories one is like a bookmaking factory and the other one is like a 
printed circuit board factory that makes like cell phone parts. We just had them talk to each other, even though they, they both existed, they just never spoken to each other before. We made that connection and suddenly we're making a new thing. And so that was kind of the cool part about um, kind of having an ecosystem infrastructure as opposed to like an individual factory um, infrastructure there. And so that's kind of how the sticker started. The rest of it kind of went into a crowdfunding campaign and that like turned into its own living thing, um, which I can talk about as well if you like. But I guess on, again, on the manufacturing ecosystem side, um, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's very important that everything is so close together so that you can like in less than a day, get this factory and that factory to like connect and try something together. The other thing is people are just very open to experimenting. It's like, if you got the idea and you have the resources, they'll do it. Um, they'll try it for you as long as it doesn't break their machine. And that openness is kind of this, and maybe like a curiosity that we're, we're talking about earlier that that makes it a lot, easier to try this stuff like that you don't have to convince the factory please do this they'll be like all right if you give us some materials and some money we'll, we'll try it for you no guarantees it'll work right and we're like okay that's totally fine this is research um the i guess the interesting thing going back to the trip um, and thinking about wonder is that like you look around anything that didn't grow from the ground uh or was not born from something else was designed and manufactured by somebody and then you start to realize that's like basically everything around you um and it, it we don't we don't realize it but yeah like all these things that we have that aren't naturally grown they and even the naturally grown things have had a lot of help from human hands probably depending on where you are um that is in some sense like a moment of wonder when you start to realize that like um and when we went into the factories, it was that experience because you see the thing come out at the other end, but you don't realize how many machines and probably still how many hands in how giant of a room uh, made that possible. And it's kind of once once you realize that, um, you start to think of, at least for me, um, you start to think about the objects in a different way. They didn't just magically appear. Somebody had to kind of lovingly grow them with their own hands, so to speak, by, by creating, by making them, right? Um, so, so that there's a little bit of that in there. But I don't know if that kind of touches on what you were, where you were talking yeah, yeah. about. Yeah, no, and it guides kind of into this idea of, um, I don't like to use this word maker, but we don't seem to have a better way of talking about it. Um, mm -hmm. So the, this idea of these kind of maker sensibilities this way of thinking around uh, people that are making, the, the kind of awareness of the malleability of the world around them, that once yeah. you realize things deconstruct and you are a constructor, uh, it yeah. changes the self-identity. Um, I've heard you in other interviews talk about the, how laser cutting and things like Little Bits and uh, things like uh, Chibitronics is mm -hmm. democratizing who has accessibility to these kinds of experiences. Um, is that something that you would like to see happen more of or like what would be your your ideal image for this kind of access to uh, maker sensibility um you know it's, it's been predominantly this kind of male dominated uh, event uh and i know that you, you've cited research saying that uh, with just a little bit more awareness you know women jump into this kind of activity as well um where would you like this to how would you like this to evolve uh, yeah, so there, actually there's a lot of really great points in that. Uh, so for, so the first one is the idea that like that these pre-made things can be taken apart and can be tweaked and can be changed. So like a finished object as a material, that's really, really important. And I think that's kind of the tinkering um, idea that you were, you talked about first. Um, uh, so, so I think that in some ways there's, there's a lot of that happening already. We might not think of it as making and creating, but it is. And so that kind of brings me to the second point, which is that um, the whole maker thing, it's just, it's one word, but it, it really, the idea of that you can create, you can, you are the, a generator of things. Um, that's, that happens every time you fix something, every time you write a message, you're creating something. It's um, the, 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 maybe identity of a creator is much more broad than, you know, plugging something into a breadboard and putting that inside a 3D printed case, right? Like maybe that those are some uh, 
materials and tools typically associated with maker, but like fixing anything, creating anything is a making act. And so in some ways, maybe we should broaden what we apply the word maker to and to like celebrate all forms of creation. Um, so that's kind of the second point. And the third one is the idea of bringing more diverse audiences into this creative um, uh, conversation, say, um, especially around, for, for me, it's around technology and pro or electronics and programming, because I think they're just really powerful ways of creating. Um, and the, I mean, let me wax poetic a little bit, but it's literally an invisible energy that you have access to once you figure out how to make them connect the right connections it's it's literally magic you know it's it's wireless it it's invisible you you can't see it but stuff happens it's that's basically magic as far as i can tell so you know that's a very powerful tool um and it's just about showing all the different ways you can channel this energy you know that that i think can um make it more interesting and inviting to broader audiences like women like kids like you know maybe older uh learners who because typically we create all these kits and things when we think about like teaching kids but really you could teach anyone any anyone can pick up electronics like they can pick up a, a new language or maybe a new show that they're excited about like why not um so i i think that you know, and ultimately, I there's this little phrase that I like to use, which is like circuits as crayons. Well, anybody can, um, or not anybody, but very early on, we ex we 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 have the expectation that you can draw and make cool things with crayons. Well, why don't we do that with interactivity, with this invisible energy? I, I think we can. Um, and so, you know, one day I hope that it won't be a big deal that we're making like light up poetry in our sketchbooks that'll just be a thing that people do because it's cool not because it's like oh this next important stem whatever you know um so i guess how do we make um how do we almost normalize creating technology as yet another expressive medium does that make yeah, sense you know, what was really interesting was um how you crowdsourced or you know use twitter for people to kind of hashtag out their experiences um, with the paper circuits. I, I learned about you from uh, the National Writing Project, where oh, yeah. you know they, that's where I first learned about um, the digital uh, workbooks. I forget what the, the exact terminology they used was, yeah, um, and, and that kind of took me down this road of like light as semiotics, like light as form of expression, wow. and that how we could use that with kids to actually. You know, it's a very approachable thing. It, like you said, it like evokes a sense of wonder. Um, and that kids could, for example, you know, identify character mood or strong emotions in a story by using different colors or use brilliance to show, uh, you know, story arc or something like that, or use blinks to show how things connect and build. I mean, just the simplest um, light forms and then they can kind of take it from there. And I'm building this off of like work with things like emojis or simple drawings with kids mm -hmm. where they can cross a different medium. Um, yeah. And Listening to Bunny, I kind of want to backtrack a little bit. Actually, let me jump into this one because it's, it's very relative. You mentioned this idea of one teacher um, using uh, Chibitronics as, or, or light circuitry at teaching the great Gatsby, that light became a metaphor where they could identify light and dark themes. This to me was the, was the beauty and like one of the great potentials of what you created is to like get people to um, not just use light to you know, make things interesting and sense of awe, but like actually communicate um, I've been uh, listening to Tom Ego, I hope I say his name right, at, at ITP, and really big on this idea of light as an expressive form of light being able to signify passage of time, light being able to signify emotions. And there's a lot of project uh, that I'm seeing from students around there, um, interactive room spaces where you walk in, and as you walk around, the lights on the walls you know, morph into these different colors. And so the, the topic is find your color. So you just come into the room and walk around mm -hmm. until you kind of find your comfort color space, which that was kind of interesting. Um, have you seen any other work with this? Or um, is that something that you, know, you kind of are developing more this idea of people using it as form of expression? Absolutely. It's actually crazy how, how where it's gone. So um, it, it's a really cool a, a cool point where it's like, you know, the all of this technology is not the ends. It's just a means to express something else. Well, one of the things that was really surprising and wonderful uh, for me is that we kind of started this as kind of like a, a, a teaching learning 
um, medium, but it's been picked up by the craft community. Um, so these are people that make like light up cards and home decor and like scrapbooks. And they're like, brill they're, they're like expert creators of craft. Like everything looks so perfect and beautiful. And they're starting to add the lights in to like highlight like, you know, parts of their card or whatever. And so um, if you, so here's an interesting thing. If you go on our Instagram feed, that's where you see a lot of these really gorgeously crafted interactive cards and whatnot that just are just so beautiful like it's they, they they these are like expert paper craft and illustrators who added a little bit of the light and technology to make it cool that like kind of harking back to the beginning of our conversation um and it's great like because it's very rarely actually about the theme of the card is rarely about technology. It's like a thank you or a congratulations. There would be a unicorn or a hot air balloon, or it's like a, the camera flash of when you're visiting somewhere new. Um, that's that's where it gets, um, I don't know, it's, it's really fun. And what's cool is that, you know, the people, at least I think the people that are making these aren't like, oh, I'm participating in technology. It's like, no, I made this awesome card and it's even cooler now because it's like interactive when you press this thing. Um, and they're all just gorgeous. Um, so, so that was kind of like a cool start. And, and, and that's kind of the, the crafter community. Um, but also you know, I've seen, um, for my thesis actually, I commissioned a, a bunch of artists to create their own artworks from this uh, with the electronics medium so that you can see um, there's papercuriosities.media.mit.edu has a little gallery of the different things that cr they created and they all look totally different um, and they use the light in different ways. One uh, created this noisy looking signal using the copper tape and the circuitry like is all you see. Another person took the circuitry and drew a boom box out of it so that you interact with the parts of the boom box and there's actually paper speakers they can hear sound out of. Um, and then other one, other people use the light as a way to uh, kind of, yeah, make the image dynamic. Another person used it in a way that when you press on this, there's this, it's called Tiki Town. There's a puppy that has ticks um, growing on its back so much so that it built a city. And in the city, there are these dark windows. And when you, when you pet the puppy, the windows light up and you can see what the ticks are doing. So there's just completely, totally different approaches to using light and interactivity to express, again, totally different things. Um, and I think it's just starting and I'm excited to see where it goes. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, I had my mic muted. Um, listening to Bunny, I really liked how he explains this idea of uh, balance, familiarity and simplicity that, you know, balance that, that it's moving back and forth between this design and engineering space that mm -hmm. you're getting to kind of, um, work from both angles or tap into different curiosities in kids, for example, um, you know, pairing kids into an activity that has both craft and art and also electronics and also another form of literacy, then yeah. you're pulling from all these different strengths. And so one student, you know, it really leverages like this idea of dispersed knowledge where, well, that kid knows how to do the you know, circuitry part really well, but that kid knows how to do the aesthetics and creativity part really well. Yeah. I found that, that idea of balance really incredible way of kind of getting at that idea. Um, have you continued, I, I see that there are like, um, there are like lessons that teachers can kind of tap into. Is there, can, who's doing the most work on this in education with, with the circuitry? Uh, there are a lot of people actually. So, um, kind of building on your point about bringing in bo both or many strings of the, you know, there's the, there's the, there's the goal of making this light up. So I know exactly what I'm doing versus the, what is this light? I have to come up with an idea. There's no right answer. Um, the, the other cool thing about that is that you might be someone who uh, understands the circuitry. So you, so you kind of use that as a familiar one, but then once you're done with your circuit, you still have to do the other side. So it forces you to start thinking um, from the kind of the, the other, the other, the creative open side. And so, similarly, if you are someone who's like loves drawing, once you've got the drawing, like you, you have, you, you want to, you know, do the second part, which is light it up. So you have to do the directed debugging, you know, um, activity and they kind of um, force a learner to practice both sides of their brain and the interesting thing is I feel like oftentimes we uh, kind of hold the electronics problem-solving engineering mindset as somehow 
uh, really, really valuable. But the creative open-ended, there is no right answer. You have to feel confident that you chose the right one for you. Like that, that skill is just as important. And I'm hoping that we actually express, we practice this. I personally, I think it's, for me, it's a harder skill of like choosing a right answer for myself when there isn't a right answer. Like that skill is so important too. And I just want to make sure that that is also in every activity because it's, because it's it's actually much harder, I think, to come up with something when there's not even a goal. Um, so just putting that out there and trying to trying to share that idea. Um, yeah, no, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to answer the second one about the teachers, but did you want to? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh. Can you say that again? Oh, oh, you're you're muted now. Uh oh, we're like reversed. <laughs> Sorry, I'm clicking my mic on and off. Um, no, fi finish your thought, and uh, and I'll jump in afterwards. Oh, so the the teachers. There are many educators who are doing totally different things, so it's hard to like highlight just a few. But for example, like Molly was doing kind of the language arts approach of how do we use uh, symbolism um, to to uh, in literal in in writing about light, but also using light things like that that you just mentioned. There's also um, Josh Berger is more of like a maker. He creates these really cool interactive artworks that's using this stuff. There's a woman named uh, Colleen Graves who's been also writing tons of cool resources like the big book of uh, maker projects, things like that, where she's starting to create her own templates and like uh, her own language for the, t the paper circuit templates. Um, the, so David Cole over at the 21st Century Notebooking project that you were talking about earlier, who's thinking more about storytelling and then now using live data to integrate that into our paper um, projects to make them uh, dynamic and uh, in real time tell us stuff about the world. Um, there's lots others. <laughs> These are the first ones that pop into mind. And the cool thing is that, you know, there's another project where um, a, a woman is creating a, a light up map that tells you about like the World War II. Um, so there's, it's coming from completely different um, uh, topics, but kind of using a similar medium with uh, this interactive medium. So, so that's, that's pretty cool. But yeah, it's coming from all over <laughs> it's it's very cool and, and there's more but these are just a few cool um no I, i've been kind of fascinated just by this this last month lab experience of how different people are attracted to different tools and mm -hmm. the way that like each kind of tool develops its own kind of culture around the tool so for example there's some people that are just hard coders they just want to code but they, you know, but they're all sort of project oriented. So they're always looking for the purpose for coding. Like who can I match up with so that my coding can put to purpose, can be put to purpose. There's others who are very into just the hard mechanics of things. They want to like take things apart and put things like together. Uh, but what, what's really fascinating is the way people interact around these technologies. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was thinking more about this idea of familiarity that this is something very accessible. Um, and also as you've mentioned before that it gets people off the breadboard so that you know you're you're explicitly putting your finger on this conductive wire on this piece of tape, so like mm -hmm. all the little connections between understanding circuitry and how all of the system works are are much more explicit as well. Um, I I know you've mentioned the Carnegie Mellon research. Is there any other data being collected out there of how this is affecting who enters this kind of maker maker realm? Uh, well, there's there's events that I'm aware of, like Fab Learn. I think is a it's explicitly focused on kind of looking at the maker uh, community and how that uh, kind of ties together with learning and education. Um, I, in my own dissertation, I interviewed a whole bunch of educators um, specifically about paper circuits. So uh, I should figure out where to put a, I'll put a link to that on my website <laughs> about that. Um, so you could check that. It's like lots of pages about specifically that. Um, there's, there's some, yeah, I, I'm, I'm less familiar. I'm sure there's other, other, uh, research, um, projects out there on this. I have to admit, since I just finished, I'm like a little bit taking a break from thinking about that. So I will get back to you with more resources soon. Uh, well, I mean, that actually is a great kind of, I think, closing in that, um, you, I mean, you're easy to find. Cheapy Tronics, you can find online. But, you know, where else do you produce? Do you have any other kind of outputs, blogs? Uh, do you still research or 
Um, like what, what can we expect to kind of find from you in the future? Where can people find you? And then I guess a bigger question is what's next? Like this area of, of development is moving really fast. Yeah, um, yeah. What, what, what are you dreaming of or what, what, what do you think will happen next? I'll just do like five questions that you said. So you want me to read? I'll, I'll try to go through them. So, so where to find me and the stuff that I do? Well, well tvtronics.com is the tools that I'm creating. My um, so, so that you can go there and check out our new Love to Code stuff because that's what I'm working on right now. Or we're literally releasing it throughout this summer. It's all like there's this, oh, there's a storybook that I'm working with um, a children's book illustrator author named K-Fi. Um, that's like, it's just really, I'm very excited about, but that's that's the that's the new thing that we're working on. Um, so chibitronics.com. My website is technology with a J-I-E at the end, because that's my name, dot com. So technology.com. And that has my personal projects and I'll put my dissertation up there if you want to check it out. Um, for in terms, you could find like at chibitronics, um, on Twitter, on Instagram, those those two channels are where you can see the most recent stuff that the educators and the um, crafters and really whoever uh, is is working with this stuff and reaching out to us. That's where you can see the most recent stuff that other people are doing. So you should check that out. Um, I'm at Q I J I E on Twitter. I so you can find me personally there. Um, so those are those are the main channels. I, I'm not super active on social media. Uh, Let's see. What was the next question? Oh, what what what's kind of what's up next, or where where is this all going? Yeah, I mean, I, I just went to um, James Deck. I visited him over at Marymount, and you know they're working with um, paper circuitry. They're working with thread, you know, uh, c conductive thread. They're working with um, you know sewing chips into people's clothing to create you know effects on their clothes. I, I feel like this is a, a very fast paced environment. And I was wondering uh, if you have other sort of ideas of what you would like to do with it next. Yeah. So, well, there's two completely different directions. Uh, three, actually. Um, for me personally, I'm I'm interested in making more like um, uh, kind of artistic installations, especially around movement. So my background is actually in mechanical engineering, and so I wanted to make more like paper like blooming or coming to life through through motion and i did a lot of work with shape memory alloy early on and i would like to continue doing that so how do we make things move but in a kind of organic and graceful way as opposed to like kind of like a serve like a, a motorized you know very digital and unnatural looking way how do we make materials organically come to life and like look lifelike basically um, and so that's one direction I want to explore. Another direction I'm excited about is the storytelling side. So how do we use these dynamic paint strokes, these programmable lights and motion, whatever, to uh, tell a narrative? And so I'm actually obsessed with books as well as paper. It's a very short hop. And so I want to make an interactive storybook. And I've been t like thinking about this for literally years. But it's a story about an LED light that's named Ellie. And she uh, dreams to be a star, but she lives in an alarm clock. So it's her story of how she tries to kind of ex explore that dream. So and and through this narrative, um, creating an interactive book that is magical and kind of interactive. And you can imagine all the light night scenes and things that I will try to put in there. So that's another strand. Uh, the last strand is very different. Um, as a result of Chibitronics and working with Bunny and thinking about kind of um, the community side of creating and inventing, I'm really interested in like open source approaches to entrepreneurship, to um, to an inventing. And so I want to look at almost the more social, um, an almost policy side, I would say, of how to um, how to foster this um, and build communities around this. So. Thinking about thinking about that, especially having now created, um, seen what it's like to create a company and like enter the world in, in, in that dimension. So that's that's kind of the flip opposite. It's probably Bunny's influence. So uh, yeah, those are three things that's kind of on my mind right now. Yeah, I was about to say I, I've read through Bunny's blog and it, it's a, a a bit more of a radical voice to listen to. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm starting to like. Now that I've experienced some of this, I'm like, oh, I see where he's coming from. So I, think also, I think it's a very good partnership. You think you're, you're bad. Yeah. In yeah. Um, no, I, I love that. Well, I love all the three things you said, but especially this first part about uh, adding this idea of kind of aesthetics and fluidity to the to our interactions mm -hmm. with the with technologies. You know, it, it is kind of an abrupt jump in. You scratches is, is wonderful, 
and, and the level of this interactivity you can get off the screen into the real world and things. But it would be really interesting to explore an idea of, of making things more um, aesthetic just in the form of movement. You know, everything is a very jerky experience. Exactly, because that's what motors do, you know, that's that's what, but there are other actuators out there, like, I mean, for me, I'd be interested in exploring shape memory that because it's uh, actuated by uh, heat, it, it is by definition gradual because heat just, it's not an, an instantaneous thing. And so it's always going to be this fluid thing. Also, because it's, it is literally heat that makes a thing change shape. There's no mechanism inside. So it's totally silent. And because the actuator is totally silent, any sound from like your paper or whatever moving, you can hear that. And so that like, I, I that, gives you a lot of other expressive places to to start playing i haven't done a lot in it but that's something that i'm really curious about too yeah no and i i love the whole idea of starting with this like really low threshold easy entrance um activity uh, the way of engaging a much wider audience but you know i guess this is the kind of way the technologists think you know, this idea of a low floor wide walls high ceiling that yeah um, easy to enter there's lots of applications and it can get very complex if you if you want to take it there and that's what i, I definitely sensed uh in, in you in you, the things you've designed um i've kept you over time so yeah. thank you very much for, for joining um and this is a very interesting project to follow in the future so i'm looking forward to see see what comes out as well thank you so much it's really fun talking and, and really cool hearing your ideas too so thanks for having me here <laughs> yeah just stand just for a second i'm gonna i'm gonna end broadcasting now